Hello friends and good morning. It's great to see you again today and we're going to dive into fantasy theme analysis. This is chapter five in your current FOSS textbook. We're going to dive in by practicing with a couple of different uh, explanations to get you started with the theory and then think about a couple practice examples that we could use to apply the method. Let's go ahead and get started. So to begin, fantasy theme criticism is based on the ideas of symbolic convergence theory. Now, some of you have taken uh, comm theory or public spe speaking or interpersonal or intercultural classes before and would be familiar with this theory. The foundation is that our communication, that is our use of symbols, is what constitutes our shared reality. The best example of this is one that many of you have heard me use before. Take a moment and picture a dog. Get the picture really clear in your head. Share with me the symbol dog. Is this what you pictured? Now, some of you were expecting my puppy, Puppy Sue, who you've heard about in other lectures and we've talked about in other classes, but this is a different dog. This is uh, my family's pit bull mix, um, pit bull greyhound mix specifically. Her name is Trixie. She likes nothing so much as to wiggle. She wiggles all the time when she's happy. Oh, she's so happy. She is a rescue dog who was rescued um, after being used as a bait dog in a local dog fighting ring. Um, she was dumped on our farm, mostly dead, uh, and we brought her back to life. Uh, she weighed less than 20 pounds when we got her, but she's now up to 45 pounds, thoroughly healthy and very, very happy. She is part greyhound, so she can run over 30 miles per hour. She absolutely loves to jump in the car and go for a car ride. That's one of those things that'll make her wiggle. Oh, she gets so excited. And yes, when she's running towards you, she almost always has her tongue sticking out because she's so excited to lick you. Is this what you pictured when I used the simple dog? No, of course not. I had to use additional symbols for us to share a reality. Now imagine if we were using the symbol dog for something other than just uh, a, a simple illustration in a class. Remember, imagine if you told a landlord, I have a dog. And the landlord is imagining sort of a little purse chihuahua, right? Something like that. And you bring in uh, this 45 pound, 30 mile an hour bullet dog named Trixie, who's part pit bull. That miscommunication, that lack of shared symbols is going to create a problem or create a shared social reality. This is the foundation of rhetorical studies and it's the foundation of fantasy theme criticism. Symbolic convergence theory also dictates that symbols can converge to allow us to build a shared reality. And this can be in negative instances as well. Uh, for instance, if you grew up when I did um, as little as 10 years ago, this symbol that is uh, on the, the, the screen right here would have simply meant, okay, I'm good with that. A perfect stand in for a thumbs up. However, um, some uh, people having fun on uh, a, a subreddit that was eventually banned and then moving over to 4chan and eventually 8chan and 8kun decided that it would be a fun way to, and I'm quoting here, troll the libs and make snowflakes cry to engage in a little bit of play with symbols. And so they began using this OK symbol as a way of demonstrating these letters that they have here for white power. Unfortunately, this caught on. And at this point in 2021, the OK symbol, what was very benign for many, many years in American culture, has become very closely associated with white power in the United States. So much so that the American Civil Liberties Union is defending people's right to use it because it's an example of free speech and the Southern Poverty Law Center has designated it as a hate symbol because of what it's used for. This is an example of how symbols converge and then begin to share meanings. 
Like the group of people who wanted to take the symbol and make it into something to troll the libs began using it in such a way that it came to represent hateful beliefs that they shared and instead of being a trolling symbol came to actually stand for what the people believed, the hateful ideologies they held. And this is an example of how these shared symbols can actually build social reality and social structures. And that is what we're talking about with symbolic convergence theory. The final step is that meanings, if they are truly shared, a fantasy of experiences, emotions, and attitudes and responses can be shared with the same symbols. There's no better example of this than Ross articulating, but we were on a break. The idea here is that this became such a theme in the television show Friends that all you needed were those words. We were on a break in order to pull people's attention to the entire shared experience, their emotions supporting Ross or supporting Rachel, their attitudes about relationships and cheating in relationships, and to bring about a shared or communal fantasy and response. You're familiar with this because you often have inside jokes with your friends. Uh, one of my very favorites is in one of my little nerd communities uh, of feminist nerd scholars. It's a very small community. I'm actually wearing my t-shirt. I'm going to stand up and show you a little bit here. But this is uh, a picture from uh, the legendary Star Wars movies with the truly amazing Princess Leia. Um, and the idea that she had become the general. And the, the text on the bottom says, call me general. And it, in my little nerd communities became a way to reference how people with expertise, credentials, and experience are often in, ignored in nerd communities if they're female. And as a way for us to articulate that as experts, we were going to demand the respect we were due in our nerd communities. We weren't poser girls and we weren't anybody's girlfriend. We were experts and nerds in our own right. Those kind of inside jokes are a classic example of symbolic convergence theory. So let's talk about a little bit how to move from the theory, symbolic convergence theory, to the method analyzing fantasy themes. Fantasy themes does not mean something that is fantastical or imagined or unreal. No unicorns need to be involved in the mixing of fantasy theme criticism. However, fantasy does point to the idea that shared symbolic fantasies are creative and created imagined interpretations of events. These are not the immediate explanation of the thing you're going through. If you just cut your finger and said, ow, I cut my finger, and somebody else said, ow, I cut mine too, that's not a shared fantasy. You're both going through the actual same experience. A shared fantasy comes about when you're creating meanings about something that is not in this time and place using symbols. I'm gonna say that one more time. A fantasy occurs when you are creating meanings about something using symbols, but not in this time and place. So example, the fantasy theme is a unit of communication, a word, a phrase, a symbol of some sort that imagines and creates a shared experience and understanding for the group apart from the immediate shared moment in time. Right? So if I'm wearing my Call Me General t-shirt, um, I am conveying to other people in my feminist nerd community uh, that uh, that is something that I share with them. If I stop someone who's mansplaining to me or interrupting me um, and I say, actually, the paper you're referencing is one that I wrote last year, so go ahead and call me General. I am making up this shared fantasy experience with all the people who share my communicative experience 
away from this moment. So two friends enjoying a milkshake saying, man, I love this milkshake. That's not a fantasy theme. But if you begin to have an inside joke with your friends about milkshakes or something funny that happened when you were getting milkshakes or that cute boy who always served the milkshakes at the diner downtown, and every time you think about it, what you say is, you mean, you know, I love my milkshake. And it means a lot more than just that you like ice cream and milk blended together, maybe with some malt powder. That's when it becomes a fantasy theme. You are communicating something that is disconnected from this time and place in space. A fantasy theme, therefore, is removed from the immediate present moment. A fantasy theme is not reality, is a way of making reality better as you share it. We all know that reality can be kind of messy and things are hard, but a fantasy theme gives you simple ideas, lets everything fit together. And it's so neat. Everything fits in its nice little box. Fantasy themes give you that opportunity to take all the mess of reality and put it in a nice, simple fantasy theme box. It is a clear, artistic, and organized picture of the world. It makes sense of all this chaos. And therefore, shared fantasies provide warranting assumptions for lots of arguments in the real world. And so we're going to jump into thinking about some of those. But these are the important things to remember if you're going to use fantasy theme criticism, you're going to talk about fantasy themes. A fantasy theme is removed from the immediate present moment. It is not reality, it's a way of making reality better. It is clean, artistic, and organized, and it provides warranting assumptions for other things in the world. Let's take a look at some of those now. So there are a few different types of fantasies that you can see crop up um, to make fully regulated fantasy themes. The first are themes of setting, second are themes of character, and the third are themes of action. Setting themes would be something like the Old West or every Christmas at my house, or when your grandfather says, you know, back in the good old days. Character themes are about confining someone's vastness and complexity into just a comfortable little box. So she's such a mean girl, <laughs> nerd, he was a cowboy, or my sainted mother are themes of character. I don't need to tell you any more about those themes for you to picture the rest of the person. It simplifies the complexity and the vastness of one human's experience into the neat, tidy, little box. And then there are action themes. We're all familiar with the hero's journey from everything from Odysseus to Harry Potter. We're familiar with a family comedy drama. We've seen these on TV all the time. The boy meets girl love story. These action themes fit the complexity of human experience into simple narratives with clear and artistic plot lines. So let's talk a little bit about how these come together to build a fantasy theme. The fantasy type is a shorthand interpretation of reality. And I'm gonna minimize my video so that you can see all of this here for a moment. So imagine that I told you in summarizing a story, it was just another cowboy meets cowgirl love story. Can you picture just about everything that happens in that story? I know I can. Imagine if somebody told you, well, when I was a kid, my sainted mother would never, never let me speak to her in that way. What's the situation? What's going on? Who's the person saying this and who are they talking to? We can see the whole story through that one sentence fantasy type. Then imagine every Christmas, I go home and remember that I'm a nerd when I see the mean girls who still haven't grown up. You can picture that experience. You know the movie. You can probably even picture some of the actresses who would be in it. The fantasy type is a shorthand interpretation of reality. You can picture the Hallmark movie behind every single one of these just from one sentence. These are shared fantasy types. It's very specific what fantasy types do. They create a shared understanding of the fantasy 
completely removed from details. You don't need to know the cowboy or cowgirl's name or what part of the country or which particular state or what color their horse is to understand the fantasy. A fantasy type is shared without any sense of details. It makes meanings for groups by fitting new experiences into comfortable patterns, right? Uh, imagine when I was a kid, my sainted mother would never let us speak to her that way. You're trying to fit the complexity of some child's interaction with their parent into a clearly defined and non-complex, completely devoid of details narrative. The fantasy type is a shorthand for saying why this kid is naughty. It reinforces worldviews. Think again about my sainted mother. Well, if your mother is sainted, then your opinion, shaped by her, must be right. It reinforces your own worldview about what's right and what's wrong. And then finally, it simplifies living in a messy and complicated world. So imagine that story about mean girls and nerds. Perhaps you have grown up into a fully realized, complex, intelligent, meaningful individual, and maybe so have those mean girls from high school. But this allows you to simplify those complex adult relationships into they're the bad guys and you're the good guy because of the fantasy type. That's what fantasy types do. They allow us a shorthand interpretation of a not so simple reality. And then these fantasy types can do something even more important than that, not just give you a personal understanding, but build a shared understanding when the fantasy chains out beyond just one person. A rhetorical community can have a shared fantasy. A simple one to think about is the idea of what it means to be an American, right? Uh, simply put, my country, tis of the sweet land of liberty of thee, I sing. It's a rhetorical community, something in which we participate, a song most, if not all of us know, a shared fantasy of America that flattens out all the complexity and the nuance and the complication and just lets us simply love our country. Think how simplified that vocabulary is. Love our country, right? I get to be part of that shared identity. I don't have to deal with complications. I don't have to think about whether it's accurate or not. I just get to love my country. That shared fantasy has chained out in such a way that not only does it become part of my identity, I'm an American, I'm patriotic, I love my country, think about how I'm talking about myself there, it also then motivates action. When my sister joined the military, it was because she loved her country. When my brother joins the police force, it's because he loves his country. When I teach American public discourse, it's because I love my country. Right? That shared rhetorical vision, it's just symbols, but it has chained out and become a meaningful thing in my family's life to the extent that it shapes what three of us do to make a living. Imagine that. That's a powerful, motivating fantasy. And that's really what gets us to the core of the rhetorical criticism reason I love fantasy theme analysis, especially for dealing with complex topics, is because motives are always inherent in rhetorical fantasies. If I talk about how I love my country, there is a motivation in there. If I talk about a boy meets girl story, there is motivation there. If I talk about my sainted mother or what I'm doing for Christmas, when those fantasies chain out, it always implies motivation. And so let's think a little bit about how we might code an artifact for symbolic convergence. Uh, so first we might take a look at this famous photograph. Let's think a little bit about the different kinds of fantasies that we see going on here. 
We obviously have boy meets girl. The boy is a sailor, the girl is a nurse. Uh, so we're coding for characters here. We're coding for scene. They're obviously in public. People are watching them. Watchers are a type of character. The action that go is going on is a kiss, but I might also look at the people looking around. Does she appear to be holding him as strongly as he's holding her? Does that position really look comfortable for her to receive a kiss or not? The people behind, do they look engaged and, and happy and delighted like they're they're clapping for for someone who just got engaged or do they perhaps look a little bit concerned or even disinterested we would code the artifact for the things that we observe now this is again remember that you as the critic are at the center of your criticism so you always need to be thinking about how you build your critical viewing skills and how you are particularly going to see and code an artifact. After we've coded the artifact, then we can identify the rhetorical vision. What are the patterns that we see here? We see a lot of observers and a lot of recipients in this picture, I would say, but do we really see the woman getting to make any choices? She seems to be just a passive recipient, the object, instead of the actor in this scene. And what worldview then does this construct? Is there some patriarchy in this photo? A man grabbing a woman to kiss her. Her hands are not in his hair like she's really excited. Her hands are fisted against his neck. Is that perhaps an indication that this is not an uplifting picture? So as we identify the rhetorical vision, as we code for the patterns and identify what worldview it constructs, we can begin to identify the motivating forces going on in any rhetorical artifact. So what I'd like everybody to do for today's uh, reading and lecture checkup is make sure you read through the essays that are included at the end of the textbook, of course, but also think about at least one rhetorical fantasy that is a motive for you. Think about what rhetorical fantasies you share and how they provide motives for your action in the world. Go ahead and bring those artifacts to class, bring a discussion of those to class, and tell me a little bit about what you observe about those artifacts for today's reading checkup. Thank you so much, everybody, and I'll see you in class.